The fourth time, he told all three platoons to stay put, and he alone was going to go against the enemy. Men like Woodrow Keeble, Uncle Woody, are very rare in the sense that none of us know how we're going to react under fire or in war, whether it will be terrorized beyond action, will be paralyzed by fear. But we do know one thing about Uncle Woody, he wasn't. It was October 20th, 1951, when Woody began his fourth attempt, a solo assault on the hill. He started working his way up to the right pillbox. It would have been the enemy's left, but his right. And before he could get in grenade range, he had to eliminate the trenches of enemy soldiers protecting the pillboxes. I thought he was standing up in the trenches, and I said, why couldn't the enemy just turn their gun and shoot you in your trenches with them? And at that time, he told me how he got down on the ground in the trenches with the enemy soldiers, almost in a kneeling position, and had his rifle stock almost to the ground, and he was on the ground and was shooting at an upward angle. Woody managed to take out the enemy soldiers in the two trenches protecting the pillbox. Then he threw a grenade through the front opening of the pillbox, destroying it. Then he retreated back to his first line of defense and went to his extreme left, which would have been the enemy's extreme right, in this V formation of, of, of bunkers. He then took the second one out the same way through the front entrance, throwing with extreme accuracy a grenade through the, the opening end where the, the barrel was sticking out. This left the remaining pillbox on, on top of the V formation towards the top of the mountain. He entered that one, he outflanked it and came in through the back entrance and blew that up uh, in the occupants with a grenade. First in my mind, I thought he just sprinted up that mountainside like a 10 second, 100 yard dashman. And I asked him, how long did it take you to eliminate those two trenches full of enemy soldiers and those three bunkers? And in my mind, I thought he was going to say seconds. He just ran here and ran there and ran over here. But it didn't. It took him between two and three hours. And the entire time, the Chinese were trying to take Woody out. He was hit with shrapnel grenades, concussion grenades, a rifle fire. We later found out he took a bullet right through the chest. After taking out the enemy in the two trenches and three pillboxes, Woody's fight still wasn't over. Then he was in a face-to-face -face showdown. One eyewitness says it was seven soldiers, another says it was six, and Woody alone, badly wounded, bleeding from his chest, both arms, both eyes, a calf, nose busted from a, a grenade that hit him in the face that did not detonate. And in that face-to-face -face showdown, he eliminated all six or seven enemy soldiers, whichever it was, and they did not get him with a single bullet. And he in turn shot him each once, semi-automatic, and, and killed all seven of them. After the fight, Woody, badly wounded, refused to be evacuated until a defensive perimeter on the hill was set up. Only then did he agree to be taken away. That's when they removed 83 pieces of shrapnel from his body. There were so many men later, different quotes from different people that just attribute their life to Woody Keeble. They, they say, we wouldn't be here. Uh, we wouldn't have made it. He taught us how to survive. He taught us how to stay alive. For his actions, Master Sergeant Keeble was nominated for the nation's highest honor for valor in combat. There are required two eyewitness uh, signatures to recommend someone for the Medal of Honor. But in this case, every man in George Company, all three platoons, signed, wanting Woody to get the Medal of Honor. But there was a problem, starting a chain of events that would take place over the next half century. October 20th, 1951 was the day Master Sergeant Woodrow Keeble saved the lives of his fellow soldiers single-handedly taking out an enemy that had several platoons pinned down for days. For his actions, one of the platoon leaders, First Sergeant Joe Sagami, nominated Woody for the Medal of Honor. 
every man in 24th Infantry Division, 19th Regiment, George Company, signed the recommendation. Those orders were lost, so the men resubmitted it the second time for the Medal of Honor in December of 51. And again, the orders were lost. The recommendation was lost. Some say the race card may have been an issue. I don't believe that. I think after talking to men in uh, his outfit that they were just truly lost. Russ says what he just did, what he felt he had to do at the time. A medal wasn't that important to him. He was never bitter about it. He was never angry about it. He never seemed uh, real disappointed about it. After the war, Woody returned home, working again at the school where he grew up. Shortly after, though, he contracted tuberculosis. He went into long-term care at the VA hospital in Minneapolis, keeping in touch with his friends and family back home through letters. Because of his TB, doctors had to remove a lung, which triggered a series of strokes that left Woody partially paralyzed and speechless. Not long after, his wife Nettie died. Woody eventually returned home, but was unable to work. He did marry again to a woman named Blossom Crawford Hawkins, Russ's mother. According to Russ, Woody didn't focus on his injuries, rather on being a positive person. I think Woody enjoyed the little things in life. I think he enjoyed a good steak. He enjoyed a good conversation. He enjoyed a good movie. He enjoyed just a warm, sunny afternoon and I think it's the little things in life that he enjoyed that superseded his ailments. People respected him, men respected him, not just because of his physical size and prowess, because he was a nice, nice person, he was a genuinely nice person to visit with and to be around. You, someone that you would um, feel honored to call friend a real friend. And maybe it was because of who Woody was off the battlefield, as much as it was for his heroism during the war, that the fight to get him the Medal of Honor never went away. Several unsuccessful attempts by his friends and family were made in the years to come. Due to failing health, Woody died in 1982 without the Medal of Honor. But the fight for the medal lived on, gaining new life in 2000. I met with two of uh, Woody's uh, friends. We just kind of talked over coffee. And these guys were getting old. A lot of their friends had passed away. And we thought we'll try one last time to get Woody the Medal of Honor. And the guys said, we'd like to see it. We don't have too much time left. And uh, they said, let's give it one more go. In past attempts, efforts were made to find the missing paperwork from the original two recommendations. Then a light bulb kind of went off in our minds as we talked about this. 